thank you very much for um, uh, uh, joining into a discussion which I think uh, concerns one of the most difficult but challenging and I think important tasks facing anybody interested in changing society today, and that is developing a clear, comprehensive, and viable notion of what constitutes an alternative to capitalism. I think this really is the central uh, issue of radical theory and practice that's confronting us today because I don't think the real central problem we're facing, uh, frankly, is that masses of people have become detached from politics or they remain indifferent to the idea that they can successfully change society. Uh, I think instead the problem is the lack of an articulation of what constitutes a uh, viable alternative to both existing capitalism and what called itself status socialism uh, throughout the 20th century. And I think that this gap in articulating an alternative to both of these uh, phenomena explains why people have become detached from politics to a certain degree, or why it seems so difficult or uh, even unimaginable uh, to uh, think about a successful overcoming of capitalism. Uh, now, of course, it used to be said, and um, some people still say it, uh, that if you're engaged in political activity, what you, we sh what you or we should be focused on is first and foremost trying to uh, spell out the specific abuses of society as it exists, mobilize people against those particular problems and, problems and grievances, and that will in due time uh, generate mass opposition. And uh, further down the road, we can like get into more of the specifics or uh, overall or arching comprehensive notion what constitutes a alternative to capitalism. But I think that approach no longer makes any sense, frankly. Um, the reason is, is that um, there has been so many failed efforts to create an exit from capitalism over the past 100 years, and so much has this uh, problem uh, weighed upon the minds of the living, that I think uh, we have to work out the question, what happens after uh, a possible revolution, before one is even on the horizon? Uh, to avoid engaging in that type of task, I think, renders uh, the emancipatory project itself problematic. Our age, uh, as I see it, is defined by a crisis of the imagination, a crisis in the ability to imagine alternative modes of living and an alternative forms of existence free from capitalism. And unless we can break through that crisis of the imagination, I think it's going to be very difficult to mobilize people in terms of giving them confidence that their specific fight against various injustices can actually have the kind of resolution in a positive direction that both they and we hope for. Now I just want to say a few words in getting going about the situation in Greece, because I think there's at least one thing happening there that I think exemplifies the problem that I'm laying out here. As you all, I think, are aware, the new uh, Syriza-led government uh, is part of a very important movement, uh, not only in Greece, but uh, throughout Europe and in many other parts of the world, to develop a pole of resistance to the seemingly interminable drive for austerity uh, that defines global capital in the 21st century. Uh, recently, actually, though, uh, some on the radical left have been criticizing Syriza since it came to power a few months ago uh, for not uh, promoting sufficiently anti-capitalist politics. Now, for myself, I think the criticism is unfair. Uh, the reason is rather basic. Uh, David Black, I think, wrote a very nice uh, piece uh, about this, uh, a British Marxist, where he wrote, uh, well, he noted that uh, Sarissa was not elected to provide an alternative to capitalism. They didn't run in a program, we are opposing, the, we are, we are going to try to, uh, uh, we are part of a project of uh, positing an alternative to capitalism. They were elected to posit an alternative to austerity or neoliberalism. Uh, Black himself put it this way. Furthermore, I'm quoting him, the strength of Sarissa's position, the strength of their position, lies in their ongoing internationalist perspective. For as well as avoiding the road of socialism in one country, a historically proven dead end, Sarissa also seeks to avoid anti-austerity in one country by encouraging, for example, other upstart anti-austerity policy uh, parties in Europe, such as Podemos in uh, Spain, which may win the next election, et cetera, et cetera, end quote. So I think that uh, it, we shouldn't jump too fast to criticize uh, uh, groups, groupings like Syriza, which have made a really important opening, uh, and shouldn't ask them to do what they, so to speak, did not uh, promise that they would, they would do. Nevertheless, um, the absence of a perspective 
of how to actually transcend capitalism does have crucial political ramifications. And I think a really nice way perhaps to get a handle on this was a speech that was given by, uh, who's now the Syriza foreign minister, uh, finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis. He gave a talk not long be before he took office, before he became finan finance minister. I think the title of the talk was something like Confessions of an Errant Marxist, interesting a speech that he gave. And he said the following. I'm going to quote him directly. Uh, this is Varoufakis, Syriza. The question that arises for radicals is this, he says. Should we welcome this crisis of European capitalism as an opportunity to replace it with a better system? Or should we be so worried about it as to embark upon a campaign for stabilizing European capitalism? To me, the answer is clear. Europe's crisis is far less likely to give birth to a better alternative to capitalism than it is to unleash dangerously regressive forces on the right that have the capacity to cause a humanitarian bloodbath while extinguishing the hope for any progressive moves for generations to come, end quote. In other words, what he argues is that since the Greek left, just like the left in all the rest of the world, doesn't really know how to replace capitalism with a viable socialism at this point in time, he thinks the most we can aim for is to help save the European Union from the threat posed by neo-fascist forces like the Golden Dawn in Greece or the National Front in France. He therefore concludes the following, and I'm quoting him again. The left must admit that we are just not ready to plug the chasm that a collapse of European capitalism would open up with a functioning socialist system, end quote. Now, uh, I don't know how you feel about these comments. Uh, in some respects, they're rather uh, disconcerting, yes? Uh, that somebody who was spent 20 years, by the way, as an academic Marxist, he knows Marx's work very well, uh, mathematical economist uh, who taught Marxism, uh, including volumes two and three of Capital for many years in Greece, that a fellow like this, who's now the finance minister of the Greek government, uh, would basically say that um, uh, this is not the time to be trying to replace the system uh, itself, but to try to uh, save capitalism from itself and to try to beat off the forces of the far right. Um, but in any case, what I think he's really, he's really putting his finger on an objective problem here, that the absence of a clear idea of what it would take to create a social society, or even what a social society even is at this point in time, seems to leave the left with the option of either trying to save capitalism from itself or becoming politically irrelevant. And he says, Sarissa has no choice but to pick the first option in the hope, as he puts it, and this is what I think is the most striking formulation in this whole speech, in the hope that this can buy us some time, he says, for someone somewhere to get down to, to the task of working out a genuine alternative to capitalism, uh, a genuine concept of what is the alternative, which we don't have on uh, available before us right now. So hopefully we'll hold off, the, uh, hold off the barbarians at the gates long enough for somehow, maybe in the next 10 or 20 years, for this problem to be worked out. Now, uh, I think he's uh, putting his finger on the objectivity of the problem we're here to discuss today. Of course, you might ask, but why is it, does it seem so hard to uh, discuss what would be a viable alternative to capitalism? Why does it not even seem to be barely in sight? Well, uh, certainly, uh, I think one obvious reason is uh, that we've had uh, the failures of what called itself socialism in much of the 20th century, uh, whether it be uh, the Soviet Union, that called itself socialist, I don't think it was, but called itself that, and people still to this day think it was in one way or another, or communist China, or many other regimes, that is their failure to surmount wage labor, uh, status depression, exploitation, sexism, racism, has made a lot of people very kind of um, skeptical about the possibilities of socialism emerging in their lifetime. Uh, but of course, you would be right in respond to what I just said by saying, but wait a second, these are certainly not the only socialisms that have been out there for the last 100 or 120 years. Uh, certainly there were uh, models of socialism that arose before Stalinism and after it, after it collapsed, that uh, does not express or identify with its defects. The problem, however, in my view, is that through much of its history, the radical movement has rested on a very thin and poor definition of socialism even when it opposed Stalinism. Um, the predominant view, certainly from the time of the Second International and the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, to uh, the Third International under the Bolsheviks, right up until today, 
is that socialism is primarily defined by an equitable, a more equitable distribution of value and the abolition of private property, both of which would presumably uh, render superfluous the need for a capitalist class. In other words, capitalism was equated to market anarchy and socialism was equated to statist or uh, 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 some sort of uh, collectivized planning. Now, uh, I would be the last one to argue that a fairer and more equitable distribution of value is not a battle that is worth fighting for. Quite the contrary. We do need a more equitable redistribution of the products of labor and of value uh, in capitalist society, in any society. Um, and I don't have to tell anybody here, I'm sure, of uh, the um, vast, incredible disparities of income and wealth uh, that uh, has been generated over the last 30 years in the developed capitalist world uh, especially, but not only there, and that this disparity between the haves and the have-nots is getting worse and worse with every passing year. The problem, however, is that it's always much easier to focus on the manifestation of a problem than to focus on its root or its essence. And the problem is that everyday consciousness, the consciousness that we all naturally inhabit, the consciousness that Hegel refers to as natural consciousness, or naive consciousness, is one that stays at the phenomenal level of things. It looks at the results and takes them for granted. And it rarely inquires into what is the essence that lies behind this appearance. And the essential problem of capitalism, according to even the most basic Marxian analysis, is actually not unequal levels of income distribution, though that's a serious problem, but rather the alienated and perverse system of production for the sake of value. Now, terms might be helpful here. When we use the term value in economics, we're not saying something like, you know, I really value your smile, uh, you know, I value your friendship, why don't you come closer to me? Uh, this is not what we mean when we use, this is not, when you, when you, for the rest of this talk, I've been using the word value in the purely economic sense of um, uh, wealth computed in monetary expression. Uh, as when we say, what's the value of my stock option, what's the value of my uh, home mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, or the value of this commodity, right? Uh, wealth computed in monetary form. Biggest mistake people could make is to confuse material wealth, things, products, with value. Value is abstract. It's not material. It's, a it's an abstract designate. Money, of course, is a, a universal equivalent, okay? Um, so this is how we're going to be using the word value. This is how it's understood, of course, in any kind of uh, economic theory since Adam Smith onward. And this is how Marx uses the word value. The problem is that uh, the problem of the existence of value production itself, the existence of a system that is geared to increase value for the sake of increasing value, because that's the real heart of what capitalism is about, uh, this was not touched by the revolutions of the 20th century. They did not focus on that as the fundamental problem. What we call the value form of mediation, the fact that human relations become mediated by an abstract form of domination that takes the form of production for the sake of augmenting value as an end in itself, that was, not, that was simply not what they focused on. They didn't see it as the fundamental problem, and they didn't think out, basically at all, how you would replace such a system and overcome such a problem. Um, Instead, as uh, I think uh, many people are well aware, most radicals emphasize what? They emphasize the surplus value that the capitalist steals from the worker, but they didn't emphasize the value of which the surplus is, is unequally distributed. In other words, they put the emphasis on surplus value instead of surplus value. I know that sounds like a strange way to put it, but they put the emphasis on the work, capitalist gets more of the surplus value than the worker does, but they didn't seem to question uh, the fact that the worker is still treated as a value component, okay, or an expression or a form of value itself. And this is understandable, and we shouldn't look back on history and say we're smarter than them and uh, look down in our noses at them. It's simply uh, a, almost an inevitable problem. Marx once used a very interesting phrase. He said the transcendence of self-estrangement follows the same course as self-estrangement. That is, it's only natural that people will identify the 
problem that afflicts them with what appears to be the problem rather than the essential determinant of what afflicts them. Um, that is, the unequal distribution of value is very easy to see. We understand why that is. But it's very hard to see what's going on and what explains the reason for the existence of a system that is based on pumping out ever more quantities of value for its own sake. That's a much harder problem to get your mind wrapped around. But it's the problem that we now have to get our mind wrapped around because we've seen uh, that, uh, well, first of all, we've seen that you can have the abolition of private property and the so-called free market, even with some degree of a redistribution of value that's more equitable, uh, and call it socialism, but still not have a socialist society like the Soviet Union, which I think was state capitalist. Um, Moreover, we have uh, understood that capitalism has learned to plan. Capitalism is not completely planless and anarchic. It's a plan with, it does a lousy job of planning, uh, or at least what it should plan, it doesn't plan uh, a lot of things. But it, it clearly is not simply uh, an anarchically driven market economy. The state plays a huge role in modern capitalism, and that hasn't changed in the last 30 years, fundamentally. Moreover, uh, the punitively, um, I mean, there's other countries that we can look to more recently that have made important contributions by more equitably redistributing value to those who produce it through social welfare legislation. Uh, we can think of Venezuela in this case, where much of the oil revenue has been used to uh, fund a remarkable level of social welfare programs. It's a very good thing. Uh, and it is a good thing that they've done this. But nobody would deny that Venezuela is still subject to the capitalist law of value. That, 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 capitalist law, that is still a capitalist society goes without question. After all, 95% of its foreign exchange comes from oil revenue, uh, aside from the environmental impact of that, uh, which we shouldn't make an aside. Uh, oil is the largest world's, tr world's largest traded commodity. So it's linked into the system of value production. So the argument that basically what it made is that by defining socialism with such traditional terms as a more equitable redistribution of value and the abolition of private property, it's left us within the radical left without a vision or a concept of socialism that really speaks to the realities of the 21st century. We need a much deeper emancipatory conception in order to inspire people to join in the battle against the many ills that this society is confronting us with. Um, now, it's, this is why I decided in, uh, in trying to think out this problem, and I've been thinking about this problem for quite a few years, uh, to try to go back to Marx's work to see if he can uh, help us in this task, in working out a more viable, richer concept of a post-capitalist society as our goal. Now, you might wonder why begin there with Marx of all people. Uh, I certainly don't claim that Marx has the answers to the 21st century wrapped up in his works. Uh, moreover, we know that Marx opposed writing blueprints of the future. Uh, he disdained and criticized utopian speculation. Um, but what I discovered in rereading Marx's work, and I went as much as I could go through the Gesamthausgabe, the Marx Engels collected works in German, as well as his works, uh, uh, more available works uh, in doing this project, is that it's actually not true that he didn't discuss the nature of the post capitalist society. Now, he never wrote a book about it. He never even wrote a single essay devoted to that theme, which I'm going to explain why in a second, and I think it was a good reason he didn't do so for his time. But within his work, you find a lot of discussions, even if they're very brief or scattered in different places, of what he thinks an alternative capitalism would represent. Uh, they can be found in some of his uh, earliest works, the 1844 manuscripts or the Poverty of Philosophy. They can be found in all three volumes of Capital, something that surprised me a great deal, like why in volume two of Capital on the circuits of Capital, the sphere of circulation, why does suddenly break into a discussion of what communism looks like? But he does, uh, as well as uh, other writings as well. Now, so basically what I try to show in this book, Marx's Concept of the Alternative to Capitalism, is that he actually had more to say on this question than most people presume. Um, and um, so it's worth looking at. However, I want to make a disclaimer before I even go any further into it. And that is, I don't see my project as, as one of textual exegesis. Um, I 
even though I want to show that Marx had more to say about a post-capitalist society than many people presume, I don't think it would substantially change the issue if he had said nothing about it at all. Now, why is that? Well, first, we have to answer the problems of our day, um, and not Marx's. And secondly, just because Marx said something doesn't make it right. I mean, even uh, biblical scholars these days uh, have an understanding of a need to critically engage the text, <laughs> I would hope. Uh, we've uh, had some history of that, although uh, some don't. Okay, um, so why, why am I uh, uh, taking this approach to Marx, uh, or focusing on this aspect? The reason is that his critique of capital, that is his critique of what he doesn't like, his critique of capital, provides striking indications of what constitutes an alternative to a society dominated by capital. That is, the manner in which he worked out an understanding of what capital is and what makes it so mystifying was, I think, very closely connected to an understanding on, on his part of what life could look like in the absence of a society dominated by the capitalist mode of production. So, so that's what I'm trying to say here. Even if he didn't write specifically about what communism or socialism would look like, which he did, you can find the concept of uh, his alternative to capitalism if you carefully and deeply try to comprehend what is his critique of capital. How could that be, however? Well, there's a very simple answer to that one. And that is that for Marx, as for his uh, earlier uh, uh, forerunners, uh, great sources of inspiration to him intellectually, Spinoza and Hegel, omnis uh, determinatio in negatio. In other words, all determination is negation. It's a famous phrase from Spinoza that Marx loved to quote. That is, you know what something is by knowing what it is not. So when you critique what is, it also discloses the opposite of what it is, of what is. That is, negativity reveals not just the limits of a thing, but what stands on the other side of a limit. Hegel has a very interesting phrase about this in his Science of Logic, by the way. I'm not going to bore you with quotes from Hegel's logic. Uh, but uh, I, I, actually, I think it's quite exciting, but I, some, some people may find it boring. But anyway. Um, it makes this interesting comment in his logic. He says, in order that the limit applying to something should also be a barrier, something must pass over itself beyond the limit. It must, referring to itself, relate itself to it as something which it is not. Sounds like philosophy to me. It sure is. <laughs> well, let me, let me break it down a little bit. Let me break it down a little bit here. Basically, what I, how I interpret that in terms of what Marx was doing is that the critiques of the limits of capital which is actually what Marx's Capital, his book, Das Kapital, is about. It's a critique of the limits of capital. It's not a study of the development of capitalism. If you read the book that way, you're going to get lost. What Marx's Capital is, is a study of the non-viability of capitalism and its tendency towards self-destruction. It's a book about the limits of capital, OK? So a critique of the limits of capital, since Marx is a dialectician, cannot help but illuminate in some way that which stands beyond its limit, socialism. So for this reason, I believe, much as Marx may have wanted consciously to limit his project to a critique of what exists, he couldn't help his pen move further than that in critiquing what exists to at least suggest what's on the other side of the limit of the existence. Huh? That help? <laughs> okay. In other words, the positive is disclosed through the negative. Now, there's one other place you can find this, which is uh, surprising to me that more people haven't uh, noticed this. You know, when you read Marx's work, you don't have to go any further than the Communist Manifesto, which everybody, I think, uh, has some uh, acquaintance with. At least a lot of people do uh, uh, in, the, in the left. Um, it, Marx was a very cantankerous man. Uh, he had arguments with all kinds of people. And most of the arguments that he had with were fellow socialists and communists, yes? Huh? Where throughout his life. Uh, and um, what did this uh, criticism of socialist and fellow communist, uh, socialist and communist uh, amount to? Well, it was mainly about their limited understanding of what is the alternative to capitalism. You'll find that as early as his 1844 manuscripts, where he critiques the French anarchist uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, uh, who wanted to um, apply the quantitative determination of value uh, based on socially necessary labor time. I'll get into more of that in a minute. Uh, as a, to apply that uh, principle of capitalism to a socialist future society. 
And Marx critiques this, saying that, well, if, if we go with Proudhon's approach, we'll end up abolishing the capitalists, but without getting rid of capitalism. In other words, he says, society would replace the individual capitalist, and, and society will serve as the abstract capitalist, instead of having the individual capitalist in control. I mean, that's a critique of a certain concept of a new society on Proudhon's part that Marx was issuing. You can also find it in his critiques of other people throughout his entire body of work, other socialists and communists, uh, utopians, non-utopians, status socialists, probatists. You can talk about a whole bunch of people, which I won't go into here. I would just mention this point, though. There's something very interesting about Marx, is that every one of his works, I think, as either has a, consists of an open or a concealed polemic with the same work of uh, Proudhon. I think that you can argue that Marx's entire body of work for 40 years of development is a constant struggle against Proudhon and his followers. And uh, Proudhon and his followers had a concept of what the post-capitalist society is. What I'm uh, arguing in my book is that the basic concept that Proudhon and his followers have of what constitutes a socialist society turns out to be what, ironically enough, the Marxist of the 20th century thought constituted a socialist or communist society. And we'll go into that in just a second. That's the great irony, is that exactly what Marx was critiquing ended up becoming adopted by many of his followers. I guess there's more than one reason why at the end of his life he made the famous comment in relationship to his two brothers-in-laws. Uh, he loved his daughters, but he didn't think they married. Well, they kind of married. Well, one of them was a schlep. The other one was OK, but a little wet noodle in the head. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> uh, when he said, uh, if that is Marxism, I am certainly not a Marxist. Okay, um, so um, I think even if you just look at Marx's critique of other socialists and communists, with fresh eyes you might come away saying, hey, this is not just factional hair splitting or a cantankerous man who can't get along with people, but there's actually a, uh, a, a dis he can't stomach their concept of what is the alternative to capitalism. He has to take issue with it. Now there's one other aspect that we should also keep in mind. Marx does hold throughout his work, and I think uh, this is something you'll find everywhere. He says, you can't get to the future like a bolt out of the blue. It's got to be prepared by the material conditions of the present. He says, any effort to create a socialist society by ignoring the material conditions of the society in which we're living in now is bound to be quixotic and a failure. And I think what that indicates is that Marx uh, focused on the critique of capital, not because he thought it was unnecessary to discuss a future socialist society, but because he held that a future socialist society could only be delineated or understood on the basis of the critique of the existing conditions of capital. I think that's the approach he was taking. Now, uh, for the rest of my time here, I want to focus on the one concept that I think is central to Marx's critique of capital, which at the same time opens a door of illumination, I would hope, to trying to see what he means by socialism and what it might mean for the 21st century. And that is the domination, Marx's critique of the domination of what he calls abstract universal labor time. Now, it's no secret that time is a very important dimension of Marx's critique of capital. Uh, as I think we're all aware, uh, there's no capital without labor, right? I mean, capital doesn't fall from the sky like uh, mana or in the, in the Sinai Desert. Uh, I could just came out of that holiday, so I guess I had that in mind. Uh, there's no capital without labor. But what is labor? Uh, Marx uh, says in Capital that labor is a special productive activity exercised with a definite aim. That's all labor is. Some kind of purposeful activity exercised with some aim. Exercised with an aim. Now, if you're doing an activity exercise with an aim, what does that imply? You have a time dimension to the activity. You're thinking about where you're at now, and you have an aim to get somewhere else. I want to produce food for tomorrow morning, so I'm going to go to produce something, right? Or, or pick some crops or what have you. Uh, so uh, labor, generically speaking, has a definite aim of transforming what we find in the present and the past into what can inform or improve the future. Uh, the Czech philosopher, uh, Marxist humanist philosopher, Karol Kosick, had a wonderful way of expressing this, I think, when he said that in laboring, humanity gets in touch with the three-dimensionality of time. Time becomes present to us through creative laboring. 
It could be labor you do in your garden. You could clear out the weeds. It could be the garden you do, the labor you do to raise your grandchildren or uh, to do nursery care. It could be well, any kind. We're not talking about factory labor necessarily. Uh, that's going to actually do something else. Um, however, what's the problem in capitalism? Time takes on an entirely different significance. In capitalism, we do not organize or control time. Time instead organizes and controls us. And that is at the heart of Marx's critique of capital. The central problem of capitalism, according to Marx, is not the existence of a market or private property, neither of which he has much to say about in volume one of capital, by the way. The central problem of capitalism, after all, private property preceded capitalism. And also, you know, I think capitalism does a terrible job defending private property. Think of all the small producers and the small landowners who are mowed, away, who are mowed down and destroyed by the progress of capitalism, right? We have monopolization, right, in land and in industry. Where's the respect for private property that these idiots keep proclaiming as part of their system? Uh, I don't see it. Um, anyway, as I, mentioned, and as I mentioned before, history, capitalism could exist in a with a variety of property forms, including non-private ones, statified ones, etc. Um, and likewise, uh, there's no question that the market is very integral to capitalist society as it now exists, but you can have a non-capitalist society without a market. Um, Marx's critique of capital, however, goes much deeper than the existence of a market. It addresses the conditions that make a market possible. He doesn't critique the market in capital. He critiques the conditions that make it possible to have one. It goes deeper than the surface. And what is it that allows a market uh, system to be, uh, to be possible? Generalized commodity markets are only possible if all concrete labors are reduced to one homogeneous mass, which is called abstract labor. In other words, the central problem of capitalism is that it's a society in which value, that is wealth understood as a monetary expression, is accumulated for the sake of increasing value. Value is increased for the sake of value. This is why he says that uh, the aim of capitalism is not to make us happy. You know, I was at a concert last night, and uh, it was wonderful. Sierra Leone All Stars, a wonderful band from West Africa. And after every song, they, they said to the audience, Are you happy? Are you happy? You know? And I felt like shouting out, But that's not the aim of this society. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't, you, this, why, why didn't you? <laughs> well, I didn't want to, you know, <laughs> the music was so loud. Everyone was having such a good time. I didn't want to spoil it. But that was great music. I had a great time, too. But the point is, is that the aim of capitalism is not to make us happy. The aim of capital, Marx has, says this in the manuscripts, the aim of capitalism is to make us unhappy. Why? Because subsuming all human relations under abstract forms of domination, like money, does make you ultimately unhappy, even if you have a lot of it. Huh? Just look at all the people who are taking kinds of psychotic medication who are millionaires uh, because their life uh, is a mess. Okay, without getting into that. Um, so, um, capitalism clearly is driven not to produce material wealth, but is driven to increase wealth in monetary form. Now, what's not well understood, however, is why it's driven to increase wealth in monetary form. Is it just because there's bad people out there called capitalists? And if we got rid of them, we have nothing more to worry about? That, by the way, they are bad people. So we shouldn't minimize that. I mean, most of the capitalists are a bunch of really nasty people. But um, it's a deeper than that issue. It's a, the issue is deeper. Marx's answer is what drives capital to replace a focus on providing material wealth with providing abstract value is, the, as he calls it, the peculiar social form assumed by labor in capitalism. Now, you have all heard it said, probably too often, that labor is the source of all value. Strictly speaking, this is wrong. It's not true. Not any labor, but only a specific kind of labor creates value. The kind of labor that creates value is abstract, homogeneous, undifferentiated labor. Labor that becomes barren of any concrete content. It's just like when we talk about, oh, I'm just working. Yeah. Uh, work that becomes emptied of any human differentiation and significance and meaning. Now, concrete labor, labor done for a particular human purpose, creates use, uh, use values, while abstract labor produces exchange values. 
and exchange value is a phenomenal expression of value. Uh, I think Raya Donetsky, the founder of Marxist humanism in the US, hit it on the head when she argued that for this reason, it's not so much that Marx has a labor theory of value, but a value theory of labor. Think about that. Now, what does it mean to say that abstract labor is a source and substance of value? Because that's what Marx clearly says, is that uh, the source of value is actually not any kind of labor, but labor reduced to an abstraction, a kind of routinized abstraction. How does concrete labor, the source of use values, become subsumed by abstract labor? Well, abstract labor becomes the overriding principle of capitalism thanks to a, a peculiar modality of time. And what is that? Now, actually, you might think that the value of a commodity is, produced, is determined by the amount of time it takes to produce it, right? So you might say that, well, uh, my uh, Honda Fit has more value than this pen because it takes more hours of labor to produce my Honda Fit than it does to produce this pen. So the value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labor time it takes to produce it. But when you think of it more carefully, this can't be a sufficient explanation because if that were the case, workers would be encouraged to work slower rather than faster because the slower you work, the more hours of labor would be embodied in the product and the higher would be its particular value, right? Now everybody knows that capitalists do not encourage you to work slower. <laughs> so what's going on here? Actually, the commodity is not determined by the amount of labor time that it takes to produce it, but by the socially average necessary amount of time that it takes to produce it. For example, let's say you got a worker here in uh, Chicago. Well, we don't really do that in Chicago anymore. But let's say we've got a worker somewhere in the United States that produces something like an automobile, let's say in Tennessee, in 24 hours, while workers produce an equivalent car in China in 16 hours. The extra eight hours of labor that the American worker performs to build that car compared to a worker in China, that extra eight hours of labor does not create any value. It's considered by capital a complete waste of time. And that's why they try to get the American worker to reduce from 24 to 16 on the level of the Chinese level, let's say. In other words, what determines value, the value of something, is not the time taken to produce it, but the minimum time in which it could possibly be produced in. So as soon as some, somebody comes along with a new technological device and says, hey, I can produce that in one-third the amount of time, everybody's got to come down and meet that level, otherwise, they're, perform they're, they're paying workers to do valueless labor from a capitalistic point of view. And this is why there's a constant pressure both to technologically innovate the production process under capitalism, increase productivity of labor in a short amount of time, and there's an increased pressure to force workers to work harder and harder, and there's an increased pressure to force workers to disregard their concrete human abilities while they're working and reduce them to abstract automatons, and why there is company uh, incredible environmental destruction that accompanies the whole thing. So it's not actual labor time that determines the value of a commodity, but socially necessary abstract labor time. That's the key distinction. And uh, Marx put it very nicely when he said, in capitalism, time is everything, man is nothing. He is at most time's carcass. Quality no longer matters. Quantity decides everything, hour by hour, the day by day. And it's bound to get worse and worse as it all goes on. Almost like that. So, in, uh, in other words, what does capitalism do? It takes the defining characteristic of our species, our ability to freely and consciously organize time to meet our sensuous and human needs, and instead makes us prisoners of time. Time now presents us as a person apart, as socially necessary labor time, a force that subsumes our subjectivity under abstraction under which we have no control. Now, this is the real problem of capitalism. Now you might want to ask, but if that's the real problem of capitalism, how come most Marxists included have not said so? Well, um, you know, it's a very ironic thing. If you look at Marx's critique of the classical political economist, what does he say about them? He says, they understood David Ricardo understood that the workers are getting ripped off, that they produce more value than they get paid in wages and benefits, and he thought that was an unfortunate occurrence. 
and he was a pro-capitalist figure. Marx says that Ricardo understood the unequal distribution of value. That wasn't his problem. The problem with Ricardo and these other classical political economists, Marx says, is that he naturalized the existence of value production. That is, he thought it was just a natural trait of human beings. There was just no other way than for us to be dominated by an abstraction. Um, curiously, most of the 20th century Marxists fell into the same trap that Marx critiqued in the classical political economists. They focused on the problem of the distribution of value, but they took for granted the production of value as a natural human characteristic. But it's not a natural human characteristic to produce something for the sake of monetary accumulation. It's not a natural human characteristic to produce for the sake of profit. These are simply socially conditioned relations that arise uh, historically because of very contingent and particular reasons. So the biggest problem is when you allow a social category to become naturalized in your mind. Then you become oblivious <coughs> to its existence. You can't notice it anymore. And it becomes impossible to open up somebody's mind when they naturalize a social category, right? Unless you shake it upside down and finally get them to show them that this is so wrong. Now, Marx did not naturalize value production. He views it as a, as a very particular form of capitalism. Um, so, in other words, too many people have misidentified the object of Marx's critique, value production, with some sort of normative principle of how the new society should be organized. That is, we should figure out what is the value that, of the, that the workers are producing, this or that object, figure out how much to pay them that would be more equitable, and then how much uh, the state would then take and use for social welfare benefits, et cetera, et cetera, without questioning the whole system of value production itself. That is, without questioning the reduction of concrete labor to an abstraction, abstract labor. Now, my argument here, therefore, is once you pinpoint the central contradiction of capitalism, it's not that hard to identify the nature of the post-capitalist society that's needed to replace it. An exit from capitalism can only be achieved, Marx thinks, unless production for the sake of value is ended. But how do you end production for the sake of value? You end it by ending the split in the category of labor between concrete versus abstract. And how do you do that? Uh, by the way, why is that important? If you eliminate abstract labor, abstract labor is a substance of value. If there's no more abstract labor, there's no more substance to the value, therefore there's no value. Huh? But what do you have to do to get rid of abstract labor? What has to be done? Well, since socially necessary labor time is this force that accomplishes the fantastic transformation of all concrete labors into one abstract mass, we'll get rid of abstract labor once socially necessary labor time is no longer serves as the measure of social relations. In other words, in a socialist or communist society, and by the way, the two phrases, two terms mean the same thing to Marx. Nowhere does he talk about a socialist versus a communist stage. Socialism is not a lower phase than communism. Socialism and communism are just synonyms. Uh, in a socialist or communist society, actual labor time will no longer be dominated by socially necessary labor time. The exertion of concrete acts of producing use values will serve as the one and only measure of social existence. There will no longer be some force operating behind our backs, expressed through the world market and its laws of competition, that will render our activity useless or purposeless if it fails to meet an abstract average. In other words, the dictatorship of abstract time will be overthrown. Right up. <laughs> Can't wait, huh? <laughs> OK, now, I just want to give you one quote from Marx, just one. I'm not going to go on too much longer. I want to give you one quote from Marx, which probably uh, has not been uh, heard before. Not because it's that obscure work, it's the Grunder is his first uh, draft of Capital, but he spells out what that would mean. And so uh, let me just read it out slowly. He says, in a post-capitalist society, so this is Marx speaking about a post-capitalist society. In a post-capitalist society, the general character of labor would not be given to people only through exchange. Its communal character of society would determine participation in the products. The communal character of production would, from the outset, make the product into a communal general one. The exchange initially occurring in production, which would not be an exchange of values, but of activities determined by communal needs and purposes, would include from the beginning the individual's participation in the communal world of products. 
labor would be posited as general labor prior to exchange. That is, the exchange of products would in no way be the medium mediating the participation of individuals in society, even though mediation will have to take place. Okay. Now, let me break this down a little. It's a difficult quote, but it's a very interesting one. What's he saying? One, in a post-capitalist society, labor would still be a factor in uh, social reproduction. We'll have to reproduce our needs. We'll have to labor still, to some degree. Hopefully a lot less. Maybe we'll have to work uh, 80 hours a week or something. Second, however, its general character would not be based on the domination of abstract or undifferentiated labor. As I mentioned, abstract labor is the substance of value in capitalism. It's the common denominator that allows different products of labor to be exchanged for one another. That is, you can't take a hundred objects and exchange them for one another unless they have something in common. What do they all have in common? They were all products of abstract labor. Yeah? That's how they can get a value designation. You can have an average only if something, everything has something in common, right? Okay, now, <clears throat> in capitalism, human relations are therefore indirectly social. They're not directly social because all our human relations are actually mediated by value. So we have no direct in human interconnection. That gets lost and pushed out increasingly. There's some areas of life where it still exists and we try to hold on to them. Uh, but they're getting eliminated one by one. Uh, most of our relations become increasingly mediated by abstract forms of domination, such as money. So labor is indirectly social in capitalism. In contrast, in a post-capitalist society, labor, as he says, takes on a general character before there's any exchange of products at all. And what does that mean? Freely associated individuals will get together in some kind of cooperative or commune and distribute the elements of production according to their needs instead of being governed by a social form that operates independent of them, such as the state or the market. He's not referring here, Marx, to the existence of small isolated communities that operate in a world dominated by value production, because they're going to get swallowed up by it, but rather a communal network of associations in which value production is superseded on some sort of systemic level. In that kind of a society, if it were to emerge, Value, uh, uh, all labor would become directly social. We would not be socialized based on uh, an abstract average that comes between us. Rather, we would socialize, society would be socialized through our, our direct democratic human deliberation. Okay? Not an autonomous force that would do, make those decisions for us. There would be no force independent of the actual human subject that would mediate our social connections. The subjective acts of the community of individuals instead serves as its own mediating agent. Think about uh, sometimes cooperatives can work something like that out, even on a small incipient level. Now, Marx doesn't deny that exchange of some sort would have to take part in place in such a society. After all, one cooperative isn't going to produce everything it needs. However, it would be radically different, this exchange, than what exists under capitalism. Instead of exchange being based on exchange values, prices, or markets, Distribution would be governed by an exchange of activities that, he says, are determined by communal needs and communal purposes. An exchange of activities. Hey, you do this activity, okay? Uh, I'm going to contribute an activity, too, that would meet your need. Huh? An exchange of activities. Activities are, di are, are discrete, however. They can't be rendered under the rubric of an, ab of an abstract average, okay? I'm going to get more into that in just a second. Um, so, in other words, exchange value, according to Marx, is eliminated as soon as new freely associated and non-alienated conditions of labor come into existence. You get rid of abstract labor, you get rid of that end of the, the existence of value, and if you don't have any value, how can you have exchange value, right? It's like the whole house of cards falls if you pull one thing out from the bottom. Now, I, this is just what he says in that quote in the Grimmerism. Now, I can give quotes from volume one of Capital, volume two, volume three, we can go on for another six hours, or you can read my book, which uh, has more detail than that. So I'm not going to uh, uh, spin the wheels here too much. Uh, but I hope uh, you would see that uh, this is, the, the, um, uh, this is the, the red thread. This is the, again and again and again and again. Every time he talks about a post-capital society, this is what he's talking about. And what I found very surprising when I got there and found these passages, he never even mentions the state. I'm not saying he's, he doesn't need any role for it, but he just kind of like, that's not the issue. 
That's not the issue. Um, he spells that out more in the Critique of the Gotha program, by the way. I'll just say one word on that. Because you might say, um, well, how, how, does, uh, how does this actually work? <laughs> now, that's where he actually has his most fullest discussion of this post-capitalist arrangement. And what does he basically say? First, Marx's point is that the break between capitalism and the most initial or defective stage of socialism, or communism, which would mean the same thing, is much deeper that break than most people imagine. He does not think that socialism is defined by nationalized property. You can have nationalized property and still be in capitalism. Um, what is the real break? The break is, as soon as you've got socialism, value production has been left aside. What do you have there for? You have a society of free people who directly take part in producing, distributing, and consuming the total social product. There is no objectified expression of social labor that exists as a person apart from them. Moreover, labor time in this, in this uh, society uh, basically is divided up or proportioned in accordance with the need to replenish the means of production and the meat to consumption needs of individuals. But not based on an average of labor time, but on the amount of labor you contribute to the community. In other words, every individual is compensated in the initial phase of socialism on the basis of the actual amount, the amount, not the value, of the labor time that they engage in. I put in four hours of work today for my community, and in exchange, I get four hours of goods or services withdrawn from the common storehouse that took that much time to produce by other individuals in my community. It's a quid pro quo that applies to your given cooperative or community. It's not a rule of the society as a whole, though. It's not a social average that applies everywhere, because cooperative A, it might take four hours to make this. Cooperative B, it may take two hours to make that, right? Cooperative three, it may take 14 hours to make that. Each cooperative determines what you get based on the labor input that you give in actual amounts or quantums of labor time. That determines the quantum of consumer goods you get from the common storehouse. So he's breaking with this abstract average system right, by having this kind of a quid pro quo because he realizes that in the initial phase of a new society, you're not going to be able to practice from each according to your ability to each according to your need the day after you've uh, made the revolution. Marx is a very visionary thinker, but he's also an extremely realistic one from each according to your ability to each according to your need. Do you really think that means a quid pro quo? That in the future society, uh, that's what he calls the higher phase of socialism or communism. Does he, do you really think he means that, oh, I will, uh, uh, my needs will be met in accordance with how much abilities I have? That's not what that quote is saying. From each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Each gets their needs met each gives to the best of their ability. There's no direct correlation of the two. It's not a quid pro quo. Marx calls the quid pro quo, I get this in exchange for that, bourgeois right. <laughs> Which he defends. Which he defends only in the initial phase of socialism or communism. But there, the quid pro quo is not based on a social average. It's not based on socially necessary labor time. It's not based on value or exchange value. What it's based upon is the cooperative. Each cooperative determines based on its particular contingencies. Okay, Earl, you've worked four hours today. You get what we produced in four hours in, your, in terms of the food or the sustenance or the clothing or other things you need. Right? It's going to vary in different cooperatives. It's not going to be under a universal abstract rule. Um, that is extremely important because the, it all comes down to one little word. The difference between abstract labor time and actual labor time. Now, in the higher phase of communism, you don't have to worry about labor time at all. You're not measuring things. You don't need to measure things. There's an abundance, supposedly, and people take based on what they uh, need, and they give on the basis of what they can contribute. This, of course, assumes a real transformation of the human personality, which is not yeah. going to happen. Uh, very quickly. We're going to have to really change ourselves. Yes? But I should mention, for those of you who are interested, I think Marx is thinking of Aristotle here. You know, Aristotle has a very interesting discussion in his ethics. What's a true friend? He says there are three types of friends. One is a friend that you, you're friend with somebody because you want to get something out of them, like using them. 
And then those friendships don't last very long, because once what you use them for disappears, you don't want to be their friends anymore. The second you are a friend with somebody because you want to get pleasure from them, you know, which is nice, but if you can't get pleasure from them anymore, then you dump them. Those friendships don't last. What's the type of friendship that really lasts? What's the real type of love that lasts? Selfless. Well, when you give to the other for the sake of who they are without expectation of return. When you really love someone. Now, that's, Aristotle doesn't think everybody in society is going to be a perfect friend of yours. That's why he says, well, we do need the state, we do need this system of justice, we do need the, all that. But it's the parallel structure here Marx is saying in the higher phase of communism, we leave aside the sphere of distributive justice. We leave aside bourgeois right. That's gone now. Now what we have is you give to the society for the sake of your love of the other, and the society gives to you for the sake of its love of yourself. Huh? But we're not going to get there without a long period of transformation. That lower <coughs> phase of socialism or communism, however, is a tricky one. Because if you still have wage labor, if you still have a market-dominated society, if you still have state bureaucracy running the society, if you still have society organized according to uh, remuneration based on an abstract average, right, of, of, of how much is produced and how much time, or if your remuneration is based on how high is your productivity in a given hour of labor, you're, you're, you're planting all the seeds of the old capitalism right back into the new society, and you're never going to get to that higher phase. Instead, it's going to return you back to the old one. And I think history has proven Marx right. History doesn't always move forward. It also moves backward. It also regresses. And there's a real risk of regression if you don't get the initial phase correctly. And I, my argument is, is that the Marxist socialist movement, for a, a large degree, with some exceptions, has not adequately conceptualized the initial phase of a socialist society. They've taken for granted, they've imported too many capitalistic categories into it without knowing they're doing so. And why do they not realize they're doing so? Because they've naturalized the very question of value production itself. It's invisible to their minds. Just calling yourself a revolutionary Mar or a Marxist doesn't mean you've broken from the central conceptual categories of this society. And you've got to become a critical thinker and be self-critical and take a look and say, am I really, huh? Okay. So, to conclude, therefore, I'll just read one last quote which Marx has in the Critique of the Gothic Program. This is how he describes the lower initial phase of socialism, which he says is still defective, still has birthmarks of the old society. It's not from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. But listen to what he says. Within this cooperative society, based on common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products. Just as little does the labor employed on the product appear here as the value of these products as a material quality possessed by them. Since now, in contrast to capitalist society, individual labor no longer exists in an indirect fashion, but directly as a component part of the total labor of society. This is, couldn't be a further away from the notion of from each according to their ability to each according to their work, which is a style slogan that was attributed to Marx, which Marx never had. Now, um, I'm aware that these ideas of a new society seem distant at the moment, when even trying to discuss an alternative to capitalism seems problematic, and it may seem, boy, oh boy, are we really talking about uh, heaven on earth here, or uh, way, way, way ahead in the future. Uh, and it may appear more uh, germane to talk about what transitional forms can get us to this break from capitalism and value production that Marx discusses. I deliberately didn't take it up here, because frankly, I think uh, we already know the answer to that question. I think that the answer that the, the transitional form to get to, to a socialist society has already been told to us by the workers and other struggles of the past 100 years who have always consistently assumed decentralized, uh, horizontal, rank-and-file initiative formations that tried to break down the social division of labor in the very course of the revolutionary process, whether the Soviets in the 1917 revolution workers' councils in Spain 1936, or whether much more recently the feminist movement, or whether it be the kind of uh, 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 occupation of public spaces we see with the Occupy movement and the protests in Ferguson, which also had that dimension. Democratic, decentralized forms of 
breaking down these social divisions of labor as the very engine of social transformation. I think that provides a sense of what would be the transitional form to a new society, an organizational form to a new society. And actually, there's a lot of discussion about this. But what there isn't a lot of discussion of is what happens at the end of the tunnel. What's the ultimate goal we're striving for? So why are we spending so much time talking about the transition and not what we're supposed to be transitioning towards? I would have reversed it. I would have talked about what we're supposed to be transitioning towards and then try to fit in this historical experience into that ultimate realization of the abolition of value production. And that's why at least I hope this discussion would open up uh, some of these issues for a fuller exploration. Thank you. Okay, we've got 35 minutes for Q&A, so just keep that in mind when you're asking a question or making a comment. Uh, Peter, thank you for your talk. Uh, one thing that illuminates is why in 1984 the family was the big enemy of the state and the state was so eager to uh, eliminate the family because the family, uh, family works on the, the concept you're talking about as, as does uh, all the anthropological studies of pre-capitalist states. Uh, I want to just mention, for, uh, apropos of the usual, which is nothing, that uh, Marx also talked about our present time, which not enough people uh, pay attention to. He talked about a senile form of capitalism where fewer and fewer goods and services were created, where more and more uh, uh, money, money changes hands. And interestingly enough, in 1985, I was working with uh, people who just happened to be on their free time uh, to commodities traders. And even then, 30 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, they said, "Well, yeah, that, that's absolutely what we're talking about. We, we're talking about ma making money without creating anything." And I want to be that person who makes money. So, my question to you is: I was listening to uh, Richard Wolff the, the other day, and he was recommending. Uh, I, I, as an aside, I'm very curious about praxis, how, how we get to where we're going to go, and uh, Richard Wolff was mentioning that the, what we need is for the workplace to be ruled by the worker and for the decisions in a corporation to be made by the people who work in that corporation and to not, to, for there not to be ownership, shareholders or CEOs of this organization, of uh, the corporation. And uh, getting to the, your, how you began the talk, I see one problem with that is that it's certainly no bulwark against uh, uh, rampant right-wingism and uh, fascism, which may be uh, here or there, it may, may, be, may be relevant, it may be not. Could you comment? Uh, like I say, he didn't, he didn't speak of how we're going to get from the present situation to uh, a dem democratization of the workplace in this country and, this, and society at large. But would you talk about uh, uh, the degree to which this could be a, an initial uh, formation uh, toward toward uh, the theme of your talk. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Um, yes, I think uh, this question of employee-owned um, co uh, concerns or co-governance, right? So you're really talking about kind of more cooperative, having the workers uh, have more power in the a workplace, this is certainly the way to go. I mean, the all the power. Yes, well, all the power, yes. The democratization of the workplace, bringing democracy from the political sphere into the economic sphere. I certainly agree with those who put a lot of emphasis on this. The question is if you take, if you're simply trying to achieve this within the context of present day existing social relations, independent or isolated from a certain level of social struggle on the part of the participants who are pushing for such a thing. You may get some very different results from what, what you, uh, than what you would, would desire, right? Um, I was just uh, <laughs> telling a friend of mine here about a union meeting that was held recently. Uh, it was not a local union meeting, it was a statewide uh, uh, union meeting, uh, where uh, this is a union, which is a relatively democratic organization. I mean, there's bureaucracy, but relatively democratic, where somebody got up and said, oh, we need to begin the meeting with a prayer from the Bible, Christian Bible. <laughs> And the all hell broke loose, and people said, "Well, wait a second. You know, <laughs> this is not a religious institution. Uh, we have plenty of th other things we can be with quotes from." 
uh, and you had a back and forth, and then the person who wanted to begin with the religious quote won. Okay. Uh, so uh, and there's a lot of stuff like this going on. In America. This is in Chicago, by the way. This is not in you know Mississippi that this happened. Okay. Now, um, but when you look at something like but uh, we. Uh, Jeff here then knows a lot about the MSK, right, in Brazil, and uh, the kind of social struggles for to build cooperatives and communes that's been going on there for many, many years. I doubt you would get that kind of tendency, yes? I mean, I have a liberation <laughs> theology perspective, but it's not going to be that kind of perspective, right? Why is that? Because there's a social struggle that they're engaged in. People get radicalized as they're fighting against the conditions. And then when they demand complete control of the enterprise, they've already come to that demand with a transformative notion of what they want that enterprise to be. The problem I have with some of the discussion of cooperatives, it's almost like some people want to shortcut that necessary transformative social struggle, right? And say, let's just look at the form of a cooperative or the form of some sort of governance structure where workers can control that uh, structure uh, without uh, 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 making enough uh, attentiveness to, giving enough attentiveness to the process of breaking down uh, all sorts of prejudices and hierarchies and everything else that workers uh, imbibe by being part of capitalist society. Because we're all internalized, the principle of the racism, the sexism, the neglect of the environment, all of this gets imbibed in us in one way or another. So that's why I don't want to put too much emphasis on the form of um, cooperative organization per se, as much as its instantiations when such cooperative forms come out of a kind of social struggle in which the subject is itself transformed. That's okay. It's not no one's going to impose this uh, without revolutionary struggle. So I, I'm not worried about that. Thank you. Although we've had examples, I was once part of a co-op in New York, which uh, which was not part of did not come out of a struggle like this, right? And it was a disaster, right? So it it, it can happen. Hi, I'm calling for divine prediction from you now. <laughs> um, in the advanced industrial countries, we seem to be forgetting about all of this stuff and that the, the real uh, energy or the labor of producing the goods that we use and think are necessary come from third world countries or developing countries as the capitalists like to call them. Um, where will this come from? Where, where will the, the transformation begin? Will it begin in Brazil or in China, Indochina, Detroit? You want to, no, Go ahead. You can answer the question. You want, want me to answer right yes. now? Yes. 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 Okay, fine. Um, well, we don't know, and I certainly don't know. I mean, if anybody has the answer, I'd love to have it. Uh, I really don't know, and I've been the last one to project to have a crystal ball. All I can tell you is that uh, in my... Uh, minimal years of existence on this earth so far, uh, uh, I've been constantly surprised by where things break out. I would not have anticipated something like the Occupy movement having the kind of impact that it had. Even though it fizzled, and even though it had problems even when it was here in Chicago, and a lot of the old left came into it and kind of smothered a lot of the youth, but in overall, the, with the initiatives from the youth, it really has transformed the understanding of inequality in America. When I get up to my students now and I say to them, you know, you have less of a chance of rising into prosperity in your lifetime than somebody who's born poor in Mexico. That's what all the income status shows, right? That there's less upward mobility in the United States today than almost any industrialized country. They don't find the shocking. But they just kind of take it for granted, which would not have happened seven or 10 years ago. Now, that doesn't always translate into, therefore, hope for radical vision, right? It very often translates into cynicism. But um, definitely, I think, um, there are possibilities, and one thing that I think in the United States, we always have to keep our, our, our most attentiveness on the um, race question. Because things happen in the struggle against racism that are surprising, or maybe shouldn't be surprising, but they happen. Uh, at my college, uh, we had a, a, so, a creating justice conference last week. We in, uh, invited a group of, uh, of, of, of folks from, they grew up in the south side of Chicago. They uh, went down to Ferguson to take part in the protest, black youth. And uh, they formed a collective called the uh, Lost Voices Collective. And what they do is, uh, what they did is when they went down to Ferguson, they were sleeping on the sidewalk. With a, they would just put a piece of cardboard down, they would sleep on the sidewalk, say, we're not gonna move until, you know, they indict the police, or, or they or take back the non-indictment, etc. right? Uh, and, um, 
And then people came by and gave them tents. And then they made this their own occupied zone. They seized the public space. Now, of course, the police came over and said, you got to leave. But then other people came in and joined the encampment. I didn't even know about this, right? I mean, I've been following the Ferguson events, but this hasn't really made the news. And then they said, well, okay, we can't keep this going forever. What are we going to do? Well, let's form a cultural group, Lost Voices. Let's go around the country and, and make skits to recreate the scenarios of police abuse for other people to get them to understand what's happening in this country. They do wonderful work. I mean, there's something going on in it, with the United States. It happened in the, uh, the Arab Spring. It happens in else of these other public forums in Belgrade when they had the, or Sarajevo when they had the protests in Sarajevo last year. People taking over public spaces to try to create more human relationships. Okay? Now they come and then they disappear and they go. But there's something under the surface that's motivating people when they something breaks out. And I, I, I think it's the hardest place in the world for it to happen in the United States in many respects because of the atomized nature of our society. But if it can happen in some places here, it gives us at least something to look towards. I think it's much more likely to happen in Brazil, uh, where you have a much more socialized, politicized community of, of, of people. But, um, or Bolivia, where I'm going to spend the summer, where, no, I mean, they go on strike if you look at them the wrong way. I mean, a bus comes an hour late, a half an hour late, and they have a strike against the public transportation system. I mean, they just don't give up down there. Uh, we've lost a lot of that. But um, I don't think that we can know before we know, we have to be attentive and open and see. There may be more things on the horizon. The things are getting so alienated that, uh, I don't know, something may, may first start. I couldn't agree more. I drove in from Elgin because the topic, well, I, because I know you and I respect your work, and also because I'm totally convinced, as you are, and I'm sure many of, if not all of us here, of the need to be clear about what kind of alternative and learn the lessons from the problems of the earlier attempts to break with capitalism. Um, even in Elgin, which is 35 miles northwest of here, very different situation in many ways from Chicago, there are people who come to meetings with about the same number, 15, 20, 25, 30 people come, alternatives to corporate capitalism. And of course, there are many, many different views on it. So I wanted to, I'm trying, I have a lot of difficulty with um, philosophy and, and, and abstract thinking, which is a necessity, but it's very difficult for me. So I'm not sure I can make my questions clear, but I'm gonna try. First, I just wanted to say about the, the, what you're talking about, this collectivity, this desire to experience a new kind of freedom and creating our own space is a very powerful thing. And I think it's, it's usually understood under the umbrella of anarchism in terms of ideology, and uh, one of the people who was active and helped to formulate the public relations of uh, Occupy wrote a book, the name of which, of course, escapes me right debt. now. The greatest book on debt. On, on say, Gra debt. Graver. 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 David Graver. Yeah. Debt. But what, what's the title of it? I forget. Uh, like the first 5,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. This is, uh, you know, forget about it. I'll come back to me. I'll, I'll call you tonight with it. <laughs> but, the, 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 but, but this desire to do this, it seems to a lot of times people like Richard Wolf that was mentioned, uh, he gave a talk that was on uh, TV last night, and he ends up with examples of worker co-ops as the way to break through and create an alternative. The problem I want to speak to that and ask you about that, but I also want to try and deal with the theoretical questions as well. So to, to make it short, uh, um, most people who are interested in this question of worker co-ops and, and democratic workspaces are familiar with Mondragon, mm -hmm. the major co-op, perhaps the leading example in the world. Uh, but if you go to their website, you'll have to go to Mondragon-Corporate. It's one of the major corporations in the world. They have 100,000 employees. They've got 260 workplaces. And they only fund alternatives that have sound business plans. They are worker run. It's, an, it's a great struggle of generations, literally, to, to create this. But it takes place at, in, a, in, in the capitalist system. And to be successful, it has to be successful as a, if you will, a socialized unit of capital, as I understand it. And that's, that's their operation, so that's kind of an implicit critique of it, and I'm, if you're interested in discussing that, that's fine. What I really, what I'm stuck with at least half of my body and my mind in the old world of the Stalinist critique, or the limited critique of uh, exchange, and what I would like to try and do is to see if I can ask a clear question. 
So in terms of a break that you're talking about where Marx is writing in the critique of the Gotha program, Peter, <clears throat> if I understand you, you're, you're saying is that he's, he's, a, he's, he's saying that there has to be a complete break with the exchange system of capitalism from the beginning if we're to hope to get to, to generalize this to the whole world. And that the problem that I have is how, whenever this break takes out in revolutionary situations, it's usually experienced as a period of dual power, where the existing power centers that exist and new, new power centers, whether they're workers' councils or whatever form they take place. And yet, this takes place in a world that's not instantaneous, it's not global, it's in different conditions. And in some places, it's faced with immediate reaction, and other times they have a little bit of time before they have to meet the reaction against them. So it seems to me I'm still stuck with the necessity of having both an alternative force of power to impose, if you will, or to break the resistance to the new relationships. So in Spain, the anarchists had to have fighting units. In, in this Russia, the Soviets had to have fighting units because very powerful reactionary forces exist and will always exist until we change the whole world. Consequently, I don't see an escape from the need for a plan and for a center of power, which Marx called dictatorship of the proletariat, maybe not in the form that the Russians established it, but some form of coercive power to break the, those who would kill you. And so I wish maybe you could talk a little bit about that in terms of this emancipatory theoretical break of going back to Marx's alternative. All right, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll deal with the second one, because uh, the first one uh, kind of was implied in the earlier discussion. Uh, oh, it's an important question, too. First thing is that it's not that Marx is saying that the break is concerning the exchange relation. The break is concerning the transformation of production, labor, social, human relations, which uh, eliminates the possibility of the dominating exchange relations. For Marx, relations of exchange, and I think he was right about this, relations of exchange always are secondary, epiphenomenal, compared to relations of production and uh, itself. So it's not trying to create a more equitable system of exchange. That was his entire critique of Proudhon, organizing exchange in a more equitable way. He's instead trying to say, what kind of new social production human relations could exist in that initial phase of socialism that would break from capitalism so fundamentally that the prevailing forms of exchange would become superfluous as well as much else. Now secondly, he is certainly aware, and he says this in the critique of the Gotha program, that to get to that point, that to get to that fundamental break from capitalism, you're not going to be able to achieve it in one locale. Uh, he was very influenced by the Paris Commune of 1871, which in a certain sense informs much of his thinking about the cooperatives and associations in uh, uh, the Critique of the Gotha program. But he acknowledges always from the very beginning that there was no way that the Paris Commune was or could have been a socialist society. Why? Because you can't create socialism in one country. Why? Because the power of so the dominance of socially necessary labor time is established as a law of the world market. So even if you break away and you have your own revolution, right, you're not going to be able to create these new relationships immediately, even in the initial phase of socialism, if you're surrounded by capitalist powers. And that's what he means when he says, by dictatorship or proletariat, I mean the non-state form of the Paris communards. He thought they had a transitional form, which was, they had a state, but it was a state that was subsumed by the society, had a non-status form, that was very liberatory and conducive to that kind of political transition phase before you get to socialism. Now, the question though is very important. I've actually had a paragraph on it in my talk, but I, for the sake of time, uh, didn't uh, uh, deal with it, so I'll deal with it now. And that is, it's impossible to eliminate the dominating power of socially necessary labor time through the actions of a single country or locale. So, really what you, I think what you're asking uh, is this. Um, if you can't do so, and the power of the world market would make sure that you can't just break away on your own, uh, what can a single country do that does make a revolution? What do you do once they, the revolutionaries come to power? Well, I think what has to be done, and what should be done, is that the revolutionaries should be honest. They should tell the people that even though measures such as a more equitable distribution of value, which they would put forth, and public ownership of property are important steps, which they should, could and should immediately introduce, these by themselves do not constitute socialism, and that the problems associated with capitalism will, 
are bound to continue to plague that society in a fundamental way until there is that international revolutionary movement that comes to their aid. If that's not done, and this is what was not done in the Third World Revolutions in the past 40, 50 years, 60 years, is that the actions of the particular nation that have capitalistic features to them that haven't broken from the law of value then gets anointed as socialism. And then when people blame the problems of the society, not on capitalism, they blame it on socialism because the rulers have called it socialist. And then you turn off a whole new generation to the idea of socialism. So I think that where you're not yet at the stage where you can say, well, I, but I can't do what Marx is talking about in the critique of the Gotha program because the world market is going to consume me nevertheless, even if I try to pull out, then be honest and say, look, we need a status capitalist moment here. It will be a more progressive capitalism. That's why I start with the quote from Syriza, right? Uh, we need to, and, and, but at least tell people, okay, we're not there yet, at least, uh, uh, aim for something higher. And this is one thing with all my criticism of Lenin, very critical of Lenin for many things. In 1919, he did get up and say what? He said, the U.S., the, the, we have not made a, so, we do not have socialism in Russia. He said, we have state capitalism. It's, he said, it's, it's, it's not even worse than a bureaucratically deformed worker state. It's a state capitalist economy run by a bureaucratically deformed workers' government. And, ooh, that's pretty objective for a thing to say by the person who's running the government, who's a lifelong socialist. Huh? And this two years before the NEP, with the backward move to capitalism, this is at the height of war communism, he says this. That's so-called war communism. That's a pretty objective guy. Right? And I think one of the problems we've had is there's been such a, the word socialism has become so slippery. Like the word happiness, you know, or Lord, 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 Lord. Success. It, it, success, yeah. Uh, it's become so slippery, and it's been used in such wrong context, that the left has unconsciously done great damage to itself. Let's not get people to blame socialism for the fact that they're not liberated from all the vestiges of capitalism yet. Let's just admit to them and say, hey, we're not there yet. You know, until there's a revolution in the US, West Europe, Japan, etc., any other country in the world is going to have a heck of a hard time making forward progress. Sorry. Yeah, first uh, I think you're right when you, when you talk about it in example in Brazil that when they occupy land in order to get, gain land rights the process of the occupation is an incredibly important part of the process so I, it's just as an aside because it requires the people there for their own survival to self-organize and as a peasant as said they're peasants as they self-organize they understand they gain a certain amount of dignity and self-value and, and and therefore in mutual dependency but that, that's my question my question is I, I'm trying to if I understood you correctly when you talked about these workers' collectives, workers' cooperatives, that two hours of labor in that cooperative uh, would be essentially, exchange is not the right word, but the equivalent of two hours from the storehouse, something else right. that produced two hours. And that it may be different, and that same good may be produced for four hours of labor for whatever reasons, harshness of conditions, backwardness of uh, technology, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in, in a society where, in a really complex economy, such as we have not just here but throughout the world to produce a good like a rail a rail car for the CTA, which is a socially needed good. And, and the concept of having these different labors having value within this closed sphere, and then all these spheres interconnecting, it's sort of either I'm I've been having I'm struggling with that, and yeah. I understand so. No, it's a, and it's good that you struggle because that I didn't talk enough about. <laughs> uh, so yes, it's not that mark. It's not that planning doesn't factor in as an important factor here. There does have to be a planning, but not a top-down hierarchical planning, but a kind of a, uh, a planning that is what these different cooperatives. I think Mark Marx envisioned was a kind of federation of federations, okay, in which individuals from these different cooperatives or federations then they elect individuals for short periods of time to be in some sort of central council, like the Central Council of the Paris Commune. And they would sit down and say, well, wait a second, you're producing this in two hours. Is that really the best way to do it? Uh, somebody else here has got a new invention they discovered, and they can produce the same thing in 40 minutes, right? Uh, it's different when you have a discussion and a cooperative back and forth, and then people voluntarily say, well, let me try that out to see if I were to use that new invention, rather than having to be forced to do so through the abstract determination of socially necessary labor time as it is today. Now, they may come back to their cooperative and say, hey, let's introduce this new technological invention that will bring down the time that it takes to make this from two hours to 40 minutes, 
And then people might say, wait a second, I'm feeling a little alienated. I'm working too hard here. I'm working too fast. I don't like, maybe it works for them, but don't want, in our local conditions, it doesn't work so well for us. All the better. Then they can, right? So you, the Marx doesn't go into the details of how you would counterbalance and check all these things, and neither do I, but he does have an, un, there is a, there are ways you can work this out through a national planning mechanism that's democratically controlled, that's neither imposing an abstract average upon the participants from externally, externally, nor simply leaving it totally anarchistically, right, which well, you would run into all those problems, where each cooperative is, so to speak, speaking a different language and you've got a kind of uh, cooperative tower of Babel, yes? Now, because what's implied in all this, of course, is the question of markets, right? Uh, the, why the market socialists get a play, uh, to, to doing that they do, is they have a very easy solution to this. They say, well, wait a second, just create a price mechanism, pretty much the way we have it now, and then you're going to know how much to produce, how many hours of labor it's going to take to produce this uh, CTA rail car and everything else, and everything works pretty simply, right? And you can chart it out in a nice model. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that there is no place for any kind of market in a post-capitalist society. I'm not, I don't argue that, and I talk about this in my book. Markets will undoubtedly exist. They existed before capitalism, undoubtedly exist after capitalism. The question is not whether markets will exist. The question is whether the market, as a socially dominating and determining power, will continue to exist. Hmm? Now, if it does continue to exist, well, if there is a universalized commodity market, even if you envision labor power no longer being a commodity, don't you need some kind of universal equivalent in that situation? And if you have a universal equivalent, where would that universal equivalent come from if not a universal equivalence of all kinds of labor? And if you have a universal equivalence of all kinds of labor, don't you have abstract labor? And if you have abstract labor, don't you have the dual character of labor? And if you have the dual character of labor, don't you have alienated labor? And if you have alienated labor, don't you have capital? And if you have capital, don't you have capitalism? Why don't you say that a little faster? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next time I will. So that's my criticism of the market socialist approach. It's a, it's, a, it's a valuable attempt to think out some of the details of this, but I think it leaves itself open to the possibility that exact, it's being too specific in detail that might conceivably be introducing some factors that would actually uh, push the society back towards capitalism, or pull it back. Yeah, this is very, very difficult for me, all this philosophy and so on. I was not trained into the, uh, the, the thinking of this way of, of analyzing things, but I am thinking from the technical point of view that uh, it seems like humans have not, uh, they don't have the ability to deal with this world we live in. We are uh, very primitive in our desires, in our expression of our desires. We are very violent. Uh, we are cucked to commit crimes. And I think under that common denominator of the human being behavior, uh, we have to look probably more, or put in the formulas that we are trying to discuss, more of that human behavior. Uh, we are not very capable of dealing with the complexities of the technologies that we develop. Um, we are not very capable of uh, uh, predict the consequences of the, of the technologies that we develop. Uh, we are growing increasingly numerous to the point that uh, this is not a sustainable uh, state of, of, of situation where humans uh, are, are, are depleting everything uh, at an extremely increasing rate, which is the problem, an increasing rate. Um, so, so I really am very negative about the potential of any other system to improve the human condition to a point that it will end up in a peaceful resolution. I see it much more, much darker than that. So maybe you can comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's no question in my mind that um, we can't ultimately deal with these problems we're discussing on a purely political or economic level, or even 
particularly philosophical level, we also have to deal with them on a certain psychological level. Because capitalism mars our psyche, uh, racism mars our psyche, sexism mars our psyche, homophobia mars our psyche, environmental destruction, which you mentioned, mars our psyche. Uh, we internalize these forms of domination, and we also, they become invisible to us. Uh, this is one reason I wanted to write this book on Franz Fanon, because uh, he was the foremost thinker of how racism becomes internalized by the victim of racism, and the victimizer, the victim, both the victim and the victimizer internalize racism, though in different ways. And he, uh, as he argues, there is no resolution to this problem without political economic transformation, but there's no political economic solution uh, that overlooks the, psycho the psychological dimension. Yes? That's why he spent uh, 20 to 10 years of his life as a psychiatrist, yes? Uh, so there's an important two sides of this that have to be coupled together. Um, and the reason is, is that we certainly need new values to be able to have a sustainable society and to be able to have a viable living society. Now I'm talking about values, not in the economic sense of the word value, but ethical values. Um, but I wish to say this much about your comment. I actually don't think it's true that we live in an increasingly violent society. Uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, and the actual, I think the evidence would suggest that relative to the size of the human population, there is for the vast majority of people in most of the countries of the world today, less everyday violence than there was 100 or 200, 300 years ago. Some studies have suggested that Paleolithic societies have a much higher incidence of violence uh, and death by fighting and this kind of thing that ever happens in a modern, uh, even a capitalistic society. Of course, there's horrible violence going on and there's huge, massive amounts of people being killed, but that's actually not being done by a very large number of people, okay? Crime is not being committed by a very large number of people. Crimes are being committed by a relatively small number of people who have been pushed to the edge of social existence by a society that doesn't consider them worthy of, their own, of existing on their own accord. Hmm? And so, where you have high levels of inequality, of course you're gonna have high levels of crime, by those who are subject to the inequality. Countries like the United States, Turkey, South Africa, or Brazil have these high levels of crime and high levels of inequality. But other societies that move away from those kind of, or challenge those problems, actually indicate much lower levels of violence than you, you would even expect in a capitalist economy like ourselves. So I actually think that uh, the evidence would indicate that there's much more potential than there is um, it's not necessary any longer for us to be slaughtering each other uh, over uh, meeting our daily needs. We can produce all of our basic needs. It's just that capitalism does not have it in us to supply the basic needs of the vast bulk of the planet. But could we, we could, there's enough value being produced, there's enough wealth produced to meet the basic needs of everybody on this planet. But we have new values that are gonna have to say, hey, you can't consume that much, right? You can't overconsume. You can't just continuously consume for the sake of consuming. That's not a viable option. This is going to be the last question or comment. Peter, this part of this, this Go to the microphone. Close to the microphone. Peter, at the start, you discussed a viable alternative to capital. Mm -hmm. and, and is there anything that's been mentioned so far that we could test for viability? At the, it seems to me I, there's been a great many words, okay? Some coming so rapidly, it's hard to digest the thought behind it. But that I still don't have a picture at all of even a small scale, concrete instance of something that we could say, yeah, that's viable or it's not. Right. No, I don't think we're at that stage yet. But I hope that we can. Um, I think we're at a very preliminary stage of a discussion. I consider my book a very preliminary stage of the discussion. I'm just trying to draw out some elements of Marx that might get us to think in terms of certain concepts that could be a foundation to conceiving of an alternative to capitalism. Because I'm not saying that Marx has the answer all fleshed out. He doesn't have a blueprint, he didn't want to create one, and there's not one there, right? Uh, there have been many other people who have written on this, some are better than others. Uh, I'm looking for a way to open up a discussion and to flesh out what are still relatively abstract concepts in a much more concrete way. But you can't get to the second without getting to the first, right? can't get to the testing or the more concrete uh, uh, proof of its viability unless we first get a handle on what the problem is and what are some new concepts that we have to think in terms of. So that's where the discussion is now. 
But I hope that this discussion really takes off. And what I hear about people elsewhere in the world, some social justice movements that are spending enormous resources on education for their members. <coughs> I'm going to Mexico City in two weeks. The left wing uh, teachers union, the Sindicato, is asking me to speak down there. And these guys are studying Gramsci, Lukash, uh, Western Marxism, and the Frankfurt School. High school teachers, and they think this is important for their organizing. Right? They have a level of theoretical uh, discussion that's going on that uh, uh, we don't have here. So I want to try to get that level of discussion first picked up so that we can try to get to a more concrete level of answering some of these questions. That has to be the concluding remarks. Thank yeah. you, Peter. <laughs> oh, yeah.